Good morning. I'd like to thank you all for the warm welcome back to worship with you here at Kensington. I have received such uh, open and radical hospitality this morning, so I'm very grateful. And I understand that you are in the midst of the sermon series about essential Bible stories. And so our essential Bible story today, the still small voice, begins actually in chapter 18, in the previous chapter, where Elijah, a prophet of God, goes to visit Ahab, king of Israel, and husband to the infamous Jezebel. Ahab left the Israelite faith once he married Jezebel and began to worship Baal, the god of another popular religion in the region. Elijah's frustration with Ahab, who abandoned his faith, his history, and his god, compelled Elijah to visit with Ahab, and to once and for all demonstrate the divine power of the Israelite God and the Israelite God alone. Once he caught up to Ahab, Elijah proposed a little competition. He asked Ahab to gather all of Israel and the 450 prophets of Baal and to meet him on Mount Carmel. Ahab and his prophets accepted the challenge. The 450 prophets gathered on the mountain ready to prove their God worthy of adoration. Elijah suggested that both he and Baal's prophets each sacrifice a bull on a prepared altar, but refrain from using fire. Whichever God miraculously provided the fire for the prophet's sacrifice, was indeed the true God. The prophets of Baal went first. They sacrificed a bull, just as Elijah specified, and the text says that from morning until noon, the prophets of Baal were crying out their, to their God, asking, begging for their God to light a fire on their altar. But as time went on and on, there was no response. Next, Elijah built an altar using 12 stones, each stone signifying the 12 tribes of Israel. He called on his fellow Israelites watching him on the mountain to help him to construct the altar. He was sure that he would soon prove that the God of Israel was the one true God. After he finished his work, he took a step back and prayed to the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, saying, Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Immediately, fire came crashing from the heavens, setting ablaze the altar, the sacrifice, and the hearts of those watching. Onlookers began to proclaim that God is God alone. Those who once began to worship Baal immediately returned to the God of Israel. Elijah won his competition and won back the hearts of the once faithful Israel. But Elijah's victory just couldn't end there. He executed each and every one of the 450 prophets of Baal. When Ahab told this to his wife Jezebel, the employer of each of the slain prophets, she grew angry and in turn threatened Elijah's life. And this is where our essential Bible story picks up for today. Once Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, she sent word to Elijah that she would do to him exactly what he did to the prophets of Baal. Frightened, Elijah fled into the wilderness. The wilderness was not that of lush greenery, tall trees, and buzzing insects. The wilderness of Israel was barren, dry desert with an unavoidable gaze of the sun beaming down on all who wandered. The wilderness is a place of nothingness, a place of death. Ashamed of his actions against the prophets, and afraid of a brutal death by a revengeful Jezebel, Elijah wanders to the wilderness to die. On his journey into death, 
into shame, into solitude, he sat down under a lone broom tree. Broom trees are wide and leafy, shade-giving trees, often providing relief for those wandering in the desert wilderness. As Elijah sat there, worried, frightened, and alone, he chose not to pray for hope or for comfort. He chose not to pray for rescue, for food, or even for more shade. Rather, he uttered these words. It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life for I am no better than my ancestors. Elijah, so frightened for his life, asked nothing more than for his misery to end. I feel like sometimes we, like Elijah, find ourselves caught in a difficult space, frightened or ashamed or worried, but rather than pray for a way through, we pray for a way out. Rather than pray for what we need to journey through our moments of difficulty, we give up and avoid the journey or the destination altogether. Not long after Elijah's prayer, he fell asleep, only to be awakened by the Spirit of God, touching him and urging him to wake up and eat. He woke up to see that suddenly, right there beside him, was a cake freshly baked on hot stones, and a jar of fresh water. What he thought would be his moment of a lonely death under the broom tree turned into a moment of miraculous rescue. God wasn't through with him yet. So he got up, and he ate, and he drank, but then he laid back down again. But the Spirit came once more and touched him and said, Get up and eat. Otherwise, the journey will be too much for you. And I imagine Elijah thought to himself, What journey? I don't want to go on a journey. I want to just sit here and die. But nonetheless, he got up. He ate and he drank. And this time, he chose not to lie back down. But rather, he stood up realizing he now had what he needed to journey through this difficult moment in his life. Elijah had gone into the wilderness to find death. He went into the wilderness to find hopelessness. He went into the wilderness to find desperation. But what he found was nourishment. What he found was sustenance. What he found was encouragement. What he found was God underneath the broom tree, urging him to keep going. The food and the water he found nourished him for 40 days and 40 nights, sustaining him for his journey to Mount Horeb, or what is now known as Mount Sinai. Once he got to the mountain, he entered a cave just to spend the night there. But this was not just any cave. He entered the same cave Moses was, where he met God in the burning bush. He entered the same cave Moses was called by God. He entered a holy cave, a sacred cave, a cave where one encounters the divine. As he laid down to rest, he was again woken up by God. What are you doing here, Elijah? The voice said. He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. In other words, he said, I'm here because I have nowhere else to go. I'm here because I no longer fit in. I'm here because things have changed, and I'm not sure how to handle it. I'm here because I'm desperate. I'm here because I'm scared. I'm here because I need you. The Spirit of God replied, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. So Elijah walked from the cave, looking for God to show up. And suddenly there was a great wind so strong that it split mountains and broke rocks. Elijah searched for God in that booming wind, but God was not there. Then an earthquake rattled beneath Elijah's feet, 
shaking the ground and the mountains. And Elijah searched for God in that trembling earth, but God was not there. Then a fire broke out across the land, burning all that came in its path. Like Moses, Elijah searched for God in the scorching fire, but God was not there. After the fire, silence fell around Elijah. It was so silent he could hear it. It was so silent that he covered his face and stood at the entrance of the cave, expecting to encounter the divine. And it was then that came a still, small voice. God was not in the booming wind, nor in the trembling earth, or in the scorching fire. Elijah found God in the silence. You see, we began this story with Elijah searching for ways for others to find and to know who God is. It began with Elijah wanting to show all of Israel that God shows up through fire on sacrificial altars, through grand gestures of triumph and heroics. He wanted to show all of Israel that God was the God to be feared and God was the God to be worshipped or else. But Elijah's hopes of triumph, of victory, of power, left him alone, left him scared wandering in the wilderness, hoping to die. As our story continues, we see that God shows up not only in the fires of altars, but as broom trees providing shade for the wandering. God shows up not only as powerful and faithful prophets, but as warm cake and cool water. God shows up not only as booming winds or trembling earthquakes or earth scorching fires, but as a still, small voice speaking to us in the caves of our own lives. And we may be journeying through our own moments of wilderness as we feel frightened by what we encounter every day on the news, in the world, in our country, and even in our own backyards. Rather than praying for strength or for nourishment or to sustain us through these moments of wilderness, we may want to avoid them all together. In the midst of our wilderness, we need not look for the thunders, booms, and flashing signs to find God to comfort us in our pain or to soothe us through our fear or to guide us out of our misery. But it's the still, small voice that says, wake up. It's the still, small voice that says, you got this. It's the still, small voice that says, keep going. It's the still, small voice that says, you matter. It's the still, small voice that says, I'm here. It's the still, small voice that says, get up and finish your journey. I am not through with you yet. Amen.